According to the Alan Dean Foster novel version of Aliens, the record for the most time spent in hypersleep and surviving was 65 years. The Nostromo's warrant officer, Ellen Ripley, nearly matched this record, having spent 57 years drifting off course in the escape shuttle Narcissus. But as depicted in the Foster novel, she very nearly could have spent much longer in the lifeboat and would have eventually died. Any time longer than that documented 65 years, and the body would begin to fail beyond the ability of the hypersleep capsules to sustain a human life. Had she not been found, the years of dreaming would go on. The dreams of the alien that had pursued her on the Nostromo. The dreams of her dead shipmates. The dreams of her daughter, Amanda, far away on Earth. All would cycle around her mind in a torturous display until finally, death and nothingness. But fate had other plans for Ellen Ripley. She was rescued by three salvagers, Jernigan, Moore, and Sanders. Unnamed in the film, but later named in the novel Alien River of Pain. As described in the Foster novel, there was a fair amount of debate amongst this small group to even bother investigating the Narcissus in the first place. Some who saw the blip argued for ignoring it. It was too small to be a ship, they insisted. It didn't belong where it was, and ships talked back. This one was as quiet as the dead. More likely, it was only an errant asteroid, a renegade chunk of nickel iron off to see the universe. If it was a ship, at the very least it would have been blaring to anything within hearing range with an emergency beacon. But the captain of the ranging vessel was a curious fellow. A minor deviation in their course would give them a chance to check out the Silent Wanderer, and a little clever bookkeeping would be sufficient to justify the detour's cost to owners. Orders were given, and computers worked to adjust trajectory. The captain's judgment was confirmed when they drew alongside the stranger. It was a ship's lifeboat. These were the impossible circumstances that saved Ripley. Jernigan and his crew arranged to have Ripley and her cat sent to Gateway Station, and that is where the new chapter of her story began. As we see in the film, Ripley awakens after being at Gateway Station for a few days. She's told she was a little groggy at first, but doing better. Unseen in the film are those first few days of rehabilitation. They are, however, depicted in the Foster version, giving us a deeper sense of just how difficult waking up from 57 years of hypersleep could be. From the novel. Listening was a struggle. Sight was out of the question. Her throat was a seam of anthracite inside the lighter pumice of her skull, black, dry, and with a faintly resinous taste. Her tongue moved loosely over territory long forgotten. She tried to remember what speech was like. Her lips parted. Air came rushing up from her lungs, and those long, dormant bellows ached with the exertion. The result of this strenuous interplay between lips, tongue, palate, and lungs was a small triumph of one word. It drifted through the room. Thirsty. Something smooth and cool slid between her lips. The shock of dampness almost overwhelmed her. Memory nearly caused her to reject the water tube. In another time and place, that kind of insertion was a prelude to a particularly unique and loathsome demise. Only water flowed from this tube, however. It was accompanied by a calm voice, intoning advice. Don't swallow. Sip slowly. She obeyed, though a part of her mind screamed at her to suck the restoring liquid as fast as possible. Oddly enough, she did not feel dehydrated, only terribly thirsty. Good, she whispered huskily. Got anything more substantial? It's too soon, said the voice. The heck it is. How about some fruit juice? Citric acid will tear you up. The voice hesitated, considering, then said, Try this. Once again, the gleaming metal tube slipped smoothly into her mouth. She sucked at it pleasurably. Sugared iced tea cascaded down her throat, soothing both thirst and her first cravings for food. When she'd had enough, she said so, and the tube was withdrawn. A new sound assailed her ears, the trill of some exotic bird. She could hear and taste, now it was time to see. Her eyes opened to a view of pristine rainforest. Trees lifted bushy green crowns heavenward. Bright, iridescent winged creatures buzzed as they flitted from branch to branch. Birds trailed long feathers like jet contrails behind them as they dipped and soared in pursuit of the insects. A quetzal peered out at her from its home in the trunk of a climbing fig. Orchids bloomed mightily, and beetles scurried among leaves and fallen branches like ambulatory jewels. 
An agouti appeared, saw her, and bolted back into the undergrowth. From the stately hardwood off to the left, a howler monkey dangled, crooning softly to its infant. The sensory overload was too much. She closed her eyes against the chattering profusion of life. That was day one at Gateway Station. Christopher Golden's novel, Alien River of Pain, brings us to the event seen in the film, but offers some insight into Ripley's mindset at the time. From River of Pain. There was somebody in the room with Ellen Ripley. She kept her eyes closed. The smell of disinfectant filled the air, and she heard the comforting sound of medical machines. The sensation of sheets against her skin and a mattress beneath her back was luxurious. None of it prevented her from feeling like shit. She felt no danger from the presence, no threat, and yet in her memory there was a deep, heavy weight of darkness striving to break through. It was a solid mass somewhere within her, and its gravity was relentless. I'm so tired, she thought. But as she opened her eyes at last, she knew that she was lucky to be alive. The nurse bustled around her, checking readouts, fine-tuning the equipment, taking notes. As she watched the woman going about her work, Ripley caught sight of a window that had never been opened before. It offered a wide, uninterrupted view out into space, the complex arms and habitation pods of a space station she did not recognize, and the surface of the planet below, a planet she recognized as home. Something warm flushed through her, spreading from her core and touching her cheeks. Happiness and hope. She'd made it. She had survived the Nostromo, defeated the Beast, and made it back home. She'd be seeing Amanda again soon. Yet something was far from right. She felt sick in the pit of her stomach, and not just as a result of being clumsily pulled out of hypersleep. That darkness in her memory was pregnant with terror, bulging with nightmares waiting to be birthed. It lured her in. She thought of Dallas, Kane, and the others, and the terrible fate that had befallen them, and in her mind their faces were old and sad like faded photographs found at the bottom of an old suitcase. She thought of the bastard Ash, and he seemed not too distant. There was something else, too. Something closer. How are we today? the nurse asked. Ripley tried to speak, but her tongue felt swollen and dry. She smacked her lips together. Terrible, she croaked. Well, better than yesterday, at least, the nurse said. She sounded so chirpy and upbeat, but there was something impersonal about her voice, too, as if she wanted to keep one step removed from her patient. Where am I? Ripley asked. You're safe. You're at Gateway Station. Been here a couple of days. She helped Ripley sit up and rearrange the pillows behind her. You were pretty groggy at first, but now you're okay. This is wrong, Ripley thought. Gateway Station? She'd never heard of it. She'd been away for a while, true, but unless this place was top secret, even military, she'd have known about it. Another angle from the Foster novel. Later, another hour, another day, a crack appeared in the middle of the big tree's buttressing roots. The split widened to obliterate the torso of a gambling marmoset. A woman emerged from the gap and closed it behind her, sealing the temporary bloodless wound in the tree and animal. She touched a hidden wall switch, and the rainforest went away. It was very good for a solido, but now that it had been shut off, Ripley could see the complex medical equipment the rainforest imagery had camouflaged. To her immediate left was the medved that had responded so considerately to her request for first water and then cold tea. The machine hung motionless and ready from the wall, aware of everything that was happening inside of her body, ready to adjust medication provide food and drink, or summon human help should the need arise. The newcomer smiled at the patient and used a remote control attached to her breast pocket to raise the backrest of Ripley's bed. The patch on her shirt, which identified her as a senior medical technician, was bright with color against the background of a white uniform. Ripley eyed her warily, unable to tell if the woman's smile was genuine or routine. Her voice was pleasant and maternal without being cloying. Sedation's wearing off. I don't think you need any more. Can you understand me? Ripley nodded. The med tech considered her patient's appearance and reached a decision. Let's try something new. Why don't I open the window? I give up. Why don't you? The smile weakened at the corners was promptly recharged. Professional and practiced then, not heartfelt. And why should it be? The med tech didn't know Ripley and Ripley didn't know her. So what? 
The woman pointed her remote towards the wall across the foot of the bed. Watch your eyes. Now there's a choice non sequitur for you, Ripley thought. Nevertheless, she squinted against the implied glare. A motor hummed softly, and the motorized wall plate slid into the ceiling. Harsh light filled the room. Though filtered and softened, it was still a shock to Ripley's tired system. Outside the port lay a vast sweep of nothingness. Beyond the nothingness was everything. A few of Gateway Station's modular habitats formed a loop off to the left, the plastic cells strung together like children's blocks. A couple of communications antennae peeped into the view from below. Dominating the scene was the bright curve of the Earth. Africa was a brown, white-streaked smear swimming in an ocean blue. The Mediterranean, a sapphire tiara, crowning the Sahara. Ripley had seen it all before, in school and then in person. She was not particularly thrilled by the view so much as she was just glad it was still there. Events of recent memory suggested might not be, that nightmare was reality in this soft, inviting globe, only mocking illusion. It was comforting, familiar, reassuring, like a worn-down teddy bear. The scene was completed by the bleak orb of the moon, drifting in the background like a vagrant exclamation point, planetary system as security blanket. And how are we today? She grew aware that the medtech was talking to her instead of at her. Terrible. Someone or two had told her once upon a time that she had a lovely and unique voice. Eventually, she would get it back. For the moment, no part of her body was functioning at optimum efficiency. She wondered if it ever would again, because she was very different from the person she'd been before. That Ripley had set out on a routine cargo run in a now-vanished spacecraft. A different Ripley had returned and lay in the hospital bed regarding her nurse. Just terrible? You had to admire the medtech, she mused. A woman not easily discouraged. That's better than yesterday, at least. I'd call terrible a quantum jump up from atrocious. Ripley squeezed her eyelids shut, opened them slowly. The earth was still there. Time, which heretofore she hadn't given a hoot about, suddenly acquired new importance. How long have I been at Gateway Station? Just a couple of days, still smiling. Feels longer. It's at this point in the Foster novel that Burke arrives, along with Jones, and the conversation he has with Ripley is similar to what we see in the film with some key differences and additions. Burke makes some small talk. Nice room, he tells her, without really meaning it. He introduces himself and says it's nice to see her feeling better. Who says I'm feeling better? Ripley asks. Burke's response. Your doctors and machines. I'm told the weakness and disorientation should pass soon, though you don't look particularly disoriented to me. Side effects of the unusually long hypersleep, or something like that. Biology wasn't my favorite subject. I was better at figures. Ripley says, I hope I look better than I feel, because I feel like the inside of an Egyptian mummy. You said unusually long hypersleep. How long was I out there? She gestured towards the watching medtech. They won't tell me anything. Burke proceeds to break the news to her that she had been asleep for 57 years. The number hit her like a hammer. 57 too many hammers. Hit her harder than waking up. Harder than first sight of the home world. She seemed to deflate, to lose strength and color simultaneously as she sank back into the mattress. Suddenly, the artificial gravity of the station seemed thrice Earth normal, pressing her down and back. The air-filled pad on which she rested was ballooning around her, threatening to stifle and smother. The medtech glanced at her warning lights, but all of them stayed silent. Fifty-seven years. In the more than half-century she'd been dreaming in deep sleep, friends left behind had grown old and died. Family had matured and faded. The world she'd left behind had metamorphosed into who knew what. Governments had risen and fallen. Inventions had hit the market and been outmoded and discarded. No one had ever survived more than 65 years in hypersleep. She'd barely survived. She'd pushed the limits of the physiologically possible, only to find that she'd outlived life. Ripley's nightmare of having the alien burst through her chest is depicted, as well as finding out about her daughter's death and the inquiry that sealed her professional fate. As outlined in River of Pain, from the time Ripley is discovered by the salvage team to her inquiry, 
approximately four weeks had gone by. On June 12th, 2179, she'd emerged from hospital care, only to discover that she had become something of an oddity on Gateway Station. Almost a celebrity, with her shockingly long hypersleep and tale of survival. The company had told her not to say anything, of course, not to discuss anything of her experiences with anyone who might be unauthorized. But there were still whispers and rumors. There always were. One important note regarding the inquiry, which is not seen in the film version or in River of Pain, is an additional note from Van Leeuwen in his summation featured in the Foster version. One detail taken into consideration was Ripley's time in hypersleep. Said license is hereby suspended indefinitely, pending review at a future date to be specified later. He cleared his throat, then his conscience. In view of the unusual length of time spent by the defendant in hypersleep and the concomitant indeterminable effects on the human nervous system, no criminal charges will be filed at this time. The at this time portion noted mentally by Ripley. According to River of Pain, another four weeks went by before Burke and Lieutenant Gorman informed Ripley of having lost contact with the colony on LV-426 with their offer to join the mission. On July 5th, 2179, the pair visited her apartment. On Gateway Station, every day blurred. Every day of being no one, doing nothing, having little in her life. Every day of mourning her long-dead daughter, both the little girl she had left behind and the woman who had grown, matured, loved, lived, and died without Ripley ever getting to know her. I told her I'd be home for her birthday, she kept thinking. Always the last thing at night and every day when she woke. The guilt was as rich and raw today as it was every day. Every day blurred into one, into weeks, into months. Sleeping, waking, working, returning to her cabin, eating, washing, drinking, smoking, watching the body of her cigarette turn to ash and flitter away like the years of her life, unknown and unmissed by anyone. A life without meaning was no life at all. Today had been no different to any other day, just one of many, all the same, until the door buzzer sounded. One of the great things about having the novelizations and extended universe stories is that they can take a closer look at some of these events which lead up to the main story in greater detail. While they wouldn't necessarily work as part of the movie, I think they complement it well. Which is funny since James Cameron himself has gone on record as being dissatisfied with the Foster book. In the afterword of another novelization of one of his films, The Abyss, written by Orson Scott Card, he indirectly took a shot at the Aliens adaptation. He used the words cursory, mediocre, inaccurate, and downright reprehensible. There was also an interview he gave after the release of Avatar in 2009 where he very directly referred to Foster's novel, saying that he thought it was pretty dreadful. Maybe a little harsh, though it certainly does take liberties, such as what was explored in this video. I think it works well within the context of the book, but no doubt with Cameron's own writing and direction, along with Sigourney Weaver's incredible performance, the extra stuff simply isn't needed. It all works as it is, and we understand what this character has gone through and what she is currently enduring. This is true of the preferred special edition version, but also of the theatrical cut, which not only removes Ripley's discovery of her daughter's death, but also Van Leeuwen's final judgments in the inquiry scene. It's succinct and effective enough that we know exactly where this character's mindset is when she finally makes the decision to go back to LV-426. It just happens to take longer to get there when considering the additions made by Foster and Golden in their books. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that either, in their own rights. Ripley is a great, iconic character, and I think there's a strong desire to look into her plight just a little bit more than what was shown in the actual movie. But I'm curious. Have you read the Alan Dean Foster novelization of Aliens? Do you think Cameron is justified in his criticisms? Comment below and share your thoughts. As always, I'd like to thank you very much for watching today. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to leave it a like, and be sure to subscribe to the channel to keep up with future videos. A very special thanks goes out to Brandon James, Grizz4756, Jackson Roche, Jason A. Faney, Justin Pierce, Xenozip, and Xeno Shadow Morph, Queen Tears of the Patreon Hive. Thank you to Gregory Ford and John Griggs, the Hive's Praetorians. A very special thanks goes out to Lady Anne in the Ellen Ripley Tier of Excellence, and in the role of Wayland yutani Executives, Emurik, Nashi FX, Nicholas Butta, and Wesley A. Weaver Jr.
If you'd like to join the Hive and support the channel, check out my Patreon page in the links below. In the meantime, you can catch up with Alien Theory over social media. Follow at Alien underscore Theory on Twitter and at Alien Theory YT on Facebook and Instagram for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory, signing off.